portion of our lecture is immigration, no? the story of our youth. So here we'll talk about, no, ito yung napaagandang story ni Noah's Ark. In a biogeographical sense, it's hard to really prove ni Noah's Ark, no? But if you look at this map, there is a possibility, but highly implausible, no? If we use Occam's razor, the rule of the rule of simplicity in science, it's really improbable that Noah's Ark, the story of Noah's Ark was true. In the sense that certain, mas if you don't look at the certain marsupial geographic range, it is really far from where Noah's Ark was found. No? So those are the things you need to consider when you try to um, back your answer in that um, recitation. So those are recitations, no? yung mga pinagsasagutan natin yung Noah's Ark, yung migration ng tao, yung Wallace line, so mga yan. It's a form of recitation to form. So I'd, I'd just like to pick your curiosity. So I'd like to challenge your views on how the immigration or how the movement of these different um, animals could have contributed to the Noah's Ark. No? Kasi sabi di ba lagi may pair of species that was in the Ark. So how did Noah accounted for all the species? And the map that I will most probably use in this sense of our discussion would be the map of your dimension maps. No? These dimension maps are actually really good in predicting human migration or can be really helpful in mapping human migration because it shows how shows how weirdly connected the land masses of the world is. No? So the dimension projection is a it basically reshapes no the how the globe looks like you know? it shapes the globe into a 20-sided die no? then it strategically so it shapes the globe into this 20-sided die and it strategically cuts that die into certain portion to make the the oceans and the continent into certain position that make it make it look like it's really connected but it d distorts certain things of the map of course <coughs> so the dimension map ends up making a land connection that is so it makes up making a land connection that is continuous somehow no a more or less continuous strip so it shows how interconnected the world really is and sometimes it can be used to plot human migration. So the dimension map or the fullerin map, a fuller map, is a projection, of course. It's only a projection. It's not a true if you want a map, a real map, use a globe. No? But it's a projection on a surface of an icosahedron, a 20-sided die. So just credit to Buckminster Fuller for <laughs> uh thinking about the map no this mod the model of the map was actually created by Buckminster Fuller so this is the dimension world map so the interesting thing here is how it reveals certain aspect of our the earth's geography no especially important in the next discussion of human evolution so mm, the human evolution the human journey this this is from National Geographic website. I have no copyright. I've no copyright for this. I don't know why, why I'm using this. I'm I'm putting my name on the line so that you guys can see this. But of course, I'm commenting on it. So technically, I'm not violating any fair use uh, rights, right? So I actually want you guys to look at their website and uh, see if how accurate this is on their website of course so this is not mine no so this picture shows the modern humans how modern humans have migrated out of africa over 60,000 years ago no this map shows certain migration paths no it suggests certain migration paths when we talk about migration kasi 
in the context here, we'll always talk about migration. We'll, I, I will always say migration. But remember, I am pertaining to immigration. No? Immigrant workers. No, immigration. Just like the immigrant workers. No? When we say migration here, it is the movement of one of an organism from one area to another area or locality no and with the intent to stay in that area okay so to live outside the certain origin before things like that no when we say migration that's what we refer the movement from one area to another area so technically we're not talking about migration we're talking about immigration okay there's, there's a difference but i will always i i'll use them interchangeably here but when i say migration i'm talking about immigration okay so that's that so well the first immigrant <laughs> was not the not the mexicans no not the rohingyans in bangladesh not the philippines in the Filipinos in America, not them, no? The first immigrant was, well, humans was the, we are all immigrants, if you think about it. We're all migrants, no? We are ancient humans who have originated from the African continent. And we became, we just became widespread across elsewhere around the world, no? World. So it's a matter of, it's a scientific controversy if you think about it. But there are a lot of evidence that support this theory. You know? There are early fossil records of recognizable Homo sapien fossils were found on Ethiopia, you know, approximately 200,000 years ago. And then eventually we met some human ancestors like your Neanderthal, and so on and so forth. So early humans have are thought to have migrated across this area. No? It's either here from Ethiopian part or here in this region right here. So there are theories on but there is a cross from your African continent. So we res we originated from this portion and then we crossed the Middle East to Europe to search to India. Indian continent was also important pivotal uh, story in the colonization and then so to the Philippines, to the Polynesia, to the Micronesian Islands right here, to Asia, to Japan, Korea, to the Beringia right here and across the North American continent. To Alaska, to North America, and then we traverse this region up to the finish point, finishing point, the Chilean Peruvian mountains. Of course, there are a lot of causes or reasons for this movement of people, no? both before until now. We have food security, wars, pre-industrial societies, environmental factors, food scarcity. Um, occupying new environmental niches and the need for resources due to overpopulation are most often than not the causes for migration of humans. And of course, there are profound effects of this migration of people because as people migrated in and out of an area, they can bring new plants and animals with them and also technologies that has a very profound effect on the environment that they are moving into or out to, okay? So really there is this dynamics of what we call push and pull factors of influence to the humans to migrate, no? There's this positive and negative side to it. They can stay if the environment is kind enough for them they can settle down or if the environment is really harsh they would move out so if you look at how we have migrated to how we are now it's like a 
starting point would be Africa. No? We, well, scientists and archaeologists proposed that human Homo sapiens had started in Africa some 200,000 years ago. So we started in Ethiopia, the sub-Saharan Africa, no? below the, Sahar- the Saharan desert. And we colonized the large majority of Africa. This is very large compared to this area. Kasi. And we have colonized it for a certain time. And we only moved out of sub-Saharan Rift Valley some 60,000 years ago. And then we crossed the, Ethiop- the choke point right here in Ethiopia. And then near Somalia too. And then, or maybe here, some point here. But there's a desert kasi here, kaya baka hindi. But yeah, we, tran- we transcended that to Middle East. To, then we go to Asia. And then some parts of your Indonesia to Australia. And there's also a journey right here to the Philippines. Taiwan to the Philippines. And yep, um, across the... Russian pla- Russian part the end here towards the Bar- the Beringia, no right here and that where I'm, I'm always talking about during the glacial times we cross this since there's a Beringia ran- land bridge here and then to the North American continent we traverse that too we colonize that too and then the Mexico to the Florida coast here <laughs> to to the South America, no? the Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, Argentina, Peru, and Chile. No? And then, if you look at it, it's like a finish line. No? It's, a, it's a it's a 21,000 mile walk for our species. And we have finished. Well, we can almost always go somewhere, someplace else. But yeah, our species have gone through a lot of things. I have encountered a lot of other hominin species along the way. So yeah, roughly 200,000 years ago, we have originated from the East African Rift Valley to different parts of Africa. And then 60,000 years ago, we across the Ethiopia to Middle East and then we make it to the top of the <laughs> South America no? 10,000 years ago and this map is actually also a fuller projection no? it's a circum global route no? it shows the 21,000 mile walk that we had how do we really know this is the case? No, this is the migration pattern that we took, the migration route that we took. So the first evidence for that migration route would be paleontological evidences, the presence of your hominin species, the bones of your hominin species, the presence of different uh, hominin groups that have been found by your archaeologists, by paleontologists, and the presence of different tools that these um, early homo um, hominin groups have been using that time. So these are morely um, focused on the excavation that have happened. No? And if you look at how it is depicted, no, there are prime candidate of how human have migrated out of Africa. No? We have a northern route taken from the Saharan part portion. No? So we have we are from the East African Rift Valley right here. Humans have originated here. We could have taken this route, the Saharan route, no? okay, or we could have moved on the southern portion right here, right here, and cut across this African horn. No, so. So that then we have ano, to the Sinai Peninsula and then to Indian continent and to the Beringia. We have route to the Beringia. 
ไปเที่ยวผมเดินตัวอเมริกาตัว the southern tip of South America นะตัวออสเตรเลียตัวตัวฟิลิปปินส์ and then to to Europe and then to different parts of Russia Moscow so these uh, migration routes is actually based on of course the the bones that archaeologists and paleontologists have found on these different areas, these different caves, these different excavation sites in Africa, in the Middle East, in America, all around the world to kind of create a map of how we have migrated as a species and have colonized the entirety of the globe. No? So as you have seen in these figures you can see and notice that the african savanna has always played a big role in the evolution of humans and now that we have thousands of homing fossils in the past six million years they have revealed several phases in the biological evolution of humans no you have noticed that the early phase of human evolution would include species like your Ardipithecus and whose anatomy allows it to climb in the woodland and walk with two lords. We see Australopithecus as the next phase of human evolution. No? Lucy as a representative of this. And he is a, she is a committed biped with a small brains but still has big teeth for chewing and a big robust face. Their niche has expanded somehow. No? beyond the niche of Ardipithecus, but they consider more open habitats. No? They are found throughout the African continent. And then the third phase of human evolution, as paleontologists would call it, are what we call the early hominin groups, no? early homo genus. And here we have a creature that is really a technologically advanced, in a sense, no? a technological primate that is dependent more on culture, on the use of tools, on living in these groups. No? And the presence of these stone tools, the use of stone tools in early humans have been a pivotal role in the, well, in our lifestyle. No? In the initial competition phase with scavengers and then with predators, and then it so, it so happens that it broadens our diet and includes other, well, protein sources. And ultimately, it led to the, what we call, migration or spreading out of the Homo genus. No? This, of course, this, all of these um, skulls, uh, bones that have been excavated, would have a pivotal role to giving us an insight into the biology of our ancestors, no? the ancestors of the Homo sapiens. And it's a great illustration of how paleontology can really derive or get us some data and estimates or recreate, so to speak, the story of the human or origin. No? We can learn about our past, how, be, how we became us, humans, no? And that's what science shows the, us, no? That like, just like all other animals, we have a long evolutionary history. Just like a four-legged animals that evolved from fish ancestors, then birds evolved from dinosaurs, ancestors over series of small steps, no? Small gradual increments of evolution in a geological time scale that's the thing about evolution we evolved from a small brain quadruped apes over a long time span and now to the human species that is present all over the world today of course there is that theory no? that we are an um, african family and the most recent um, studies and recent evidence for this that we are an African migrant, immigrant, is that the presence of your genetic evidences. No? So, this study suggests that 
we are an African migrant. Some 50,000 to 60,000 years ago, we began our exodus out of the East African Rift Valley to the Middle East, to the rest of the world. Let's just say that. No? So, the African origin, this, 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 this um, theory that we came from Africa is both supported by your as we have uh, mentioned earlier, your paleontological, archaeological evidences, and your, well, the most recent DNA evidences. No? If you want to take a look or want to have an evidence of migration or even evolution in itself, you don't need to look somewhere else. You just need to search within yourself. Because within your cells, within your nucleus, are your chromosomes. Your chromosomes, your DNA, these are the evidence, the evidence for evolution. Don't need to look somewhere else. Just look at your cells. Compare it to different cells, to different genes, to different chromosomes of different organisms. You will see your phylogeny, your lineage actually. No? So yeah, both archaeological and DNA evidences no? support that we came from the African family. <laughs> African. From Sub-Saharan Africa, the East African Rift Valley, then we just migrated. No? And these genetic variations, if you look at them, we, we, well, if you look at and compare the genetic material, the DNA of your chimps, or, or let's just say across different animal groups. Let's just say that. No? When comparing the DNA of humans, of chimps together, there are only small portion of spelling differences. There are so small percentage. It represents a small percentage of our hereditary information that is different. If you imagine it, just one to two percent changes in the genetic material could produce this organism and this organism different from each other. Just one to two percent of that entire genetic material can produce that, no? Small portion of spelling differences in the genetic material can produce this totally different looking organisms, no? The human and the chimpanzee. A very small percentage indeed. That's why uh, geneticists and scientists was, well, at all at first because only a small portion of the genetic material is different. No? There are a small portion of spelling errors. And yet, with that small portion of spelling errors, you could produce a diversity of organisms that you can see. There are spelling differences we call this spelling differences within our our dna this um we call them snips no single nucleotide polymorphism and it doesn't really encode for something no? most of these uh, spelling differences are not even well not even producing any genes no not in the genes that encodes for something but they are in your dna molecule no? and these spelling differences can be used like a barcode or a molecular marker to trace how we as a species have diverged no? we track these spelling differences we track how people what uh, people group share what nations or people group share that gene marker and with that information, we can track the common ancestor of us, where did we start, and so on and so forth. No? So if they share, of course, they came from my common ancestor. So with just that single nucleotide polymorphism. If you compare them, these spelling differences can be used like molecular barcodes to trace different populations of people who share the same spelling differences. So uh, this barcoding, this spelling differences, is actually important no? to trace the history of that organism. So those, those are barcodes. 
And we can think of it as and convert it into what we call molecular markers. No? So in, you just look at these uh, color squares. These can be used to represent DNA spelling differences. No? And these are your information that you will use to create your conclusion. If they share that spelling differences, of course, they may have originated from the common ancestor, from a common ancestor. No? So, group of people from different parts of the world may or may not uh, contain the same spelling differences in certain areas. No? And the collection of these spelling differences, this colored square, will tell you no? how organ uh, how humans have migrated our origins actually precisely more or less no so if you look at this um, portion it can reveal the different migration patterns or routes that have that modern humans no have taken during the exodus uh, out of africa and this genetic evidence no, shows that there are about 5,000 extended human families. And that, no, that 5,000 human families interest, interestingly coincide with, well, fairly well with the number of human language families. That's why I, I love the study of language, especially your, the Bol people, the Kong people. Not, and not the study, but how language evolved. And the inter interesting part about how language evolved is its deep ties with the people. So remember that these migration routes, this, this overview of the migration route that our African family have taken was a result of the different studies no, of uh, the human subpopulation of these different peoples in the, the world. And by taking DNA samples from different uh, race, or what we call race, or different human groups or populations of people, we have created this uh, map of how we have uh, colonized the entirety of the map. No? So as we have mentioned earlier, um, scientists use these what we call particular genetic markers to identify the very small genetic differences among human population throughout the world, world to reconstruct this migration path. And from a genetic viewpoint, there are over, what, seven to eight billion peoples on Earth and all of these people really, it, it comes to the genetic level, are a close relative of one another. We all descended from a small band of several thousand people who migrated out of Africa about 60 to 50,000 years ago. And the measurement of these small genetic differences among these living people, these extant members, what we call these subpopulations, these human groups no, in these different nations of the world illuminates and illustrates our human origins in Africa and our migratory path. So say for example in our exam I ask you what does this single nucleotide polymorphism mutation or these genetic markers that we have means to our population? What will you say to me? Or what will you use as an evidence for the migration pattern of humans out of the, well, sub-Saharan Africa? What will you tell me? Will you use fossil evidence? Will we use genetic markers? Will you use language groups? So things like that, no? And I'd like you to focus more specifically on these genetic markers. Because these genetic markers and the next two types of genetic the, ne the next three types of genetics marker that we will discuss 
are surely a more, in a technological sense, somehow accurate depiction of the migration pattern that happened. No? Technological-wise, of course. And also, pay attention to the uh, plausible, I mean, plausible um, effects this migration could have give no, to our and to the environment that we live in. For example, the introduction of species from one place to another. Of course, when humans migrate from one place to another, they bring the seeds, the animals with them as they go, no, as they migrate. And in that sense, we can link the distribution of different animal groups, especially the domesticated animals, for the cases of the, our dogs, for the cases of our cats, and most of our pets, to our migration patterns, no? and the horses too. So things like that. It can somehow, if you think about it, it makes the discussion really exciting. But in this lecture, I won't focus on that. No? But there are a lot. No? I, I just don't want you to get, I mean, overwhelmed. There are different species, and you can exa examine the distribution of that, not only in the broader sense of the world, but also in the context of the Philippine setting. We can talk about, I mean, the whole year, we can talk about the migration of birds, I mean, the distribution of birds, the distribution of different family of plants, even I am not an expert on those plants, the distribution of bats, non-volant mammals, small mammals, so on and so forth. But yeah, you only need to have a grasp of these basic uh, concepts of population dynamics, this migration, this immigration, this um, dispersal mechanism, and a lot more you know, to conclude the patterns. No? So these are the parameters that I was talking about way, way back in lecture three and four. Okay? And if you want a harder example for this, we can use what we call the haplogroups. No? We have the first one, the mitochondrial DNA haplogroups or the human Y-DNA haplogroups. When we say haplogroup or haplotype, it is a group of alleles in an organism that is inherited together from a single parent. No? But that's why we use haplotype. We, we kind of want to limit, no? delimit our analysis to a certain portion of certain genes. No? So, these uh, groups, no, these groups are, well, they are grouped into one another because they contain or they share a common ancestor that has that single nucleotide polymer, moly, polymorphism mutation. No? That SNP. No? And since there are, they have the same single nucleotide polymorphism mutation, you can conclude that they came from the same lineage, no? the same ancestors. So there is the mitochondrial DNA haplogroups and the Y DNA haplogroups. So when you say mitochondrial DNA haplogroups, they are these are pure motherly lineage. No? So that's also a support of the migration pattern that we took from Sub-Saharan Africa, the East African Rift Valley to different parts of Africa, to the Sinai Peninsula right here, to Ethiopian portion, to Middle East, and then India, so forth, to Russia, Beringia right here, to North America, South America, the end, the end point right here, to Australia, to the Philippines, to Taiwan, so things like that, okay? So these different groupings are... Well, there are groups no, of similar uh, SNP mutations, no? single nucleotide 
single nucleotide polymorphism interactions. So mitochondrial DNA is entirely motherly lineage. And of course, your Y haplogroups are entirely paternal in lineage. No? So uh, some prefer to use the human Y DNA as a marker than your well, mitochondrial DNA because uh, of certain reasons. Scientists decide which one of these two to use in the depiction of the migration pattern, migration routes that human took in the, well, 60,000 years of their existence. Uh, I mean, after moving out, after the exodus from Africa. Well, scientists uh, carefully choose which genetic markers well most of the time they base it on how that genetic marker can accommodate for the disparity between human subpopulations so for example your y haplogroup you know, your y dna frequency the distributions of your y dna haplogroups as we call them throughout the world is sharper than those of your mitochondrial DNA due to patrilocality, no? And since your NRY and mitochondrial DNA chromosomes cannot recombine, they are really good markers, no? Since they are carried in a haploid state, that's why we call them haplogroups, no? Since they are carried in the X and the Y form, they are really good markers, no? And they have this, I mean, the dispersive genetic forces act on them relatively quickly to change their sequences over population divergence from one another, no? And I know that there is differences in the distribution of sex chromosome variation, and it is not the same for these two sex chromosomes, no, this Y and these X chromosomes. And these human sex chromosomes, if you look at them as a, I mean, if an, an animated human, no, X and Y chromosome walking out of Africa, they have migrated across the globe in a different manner. That's how geneticists saw them, no? So they, they're like moving within the humans, these X and Y DNA. And they move across the globe in, in different manner than your autosomal chromosomes. Most likely because males and females have contributed unequally to the geographic expansion due to, well, different biological and behavioral differences. No? We all know that some there are some males that, well, particularly in some cultures, there are what we call harems. No? And, I mean, that applies to your um, animals, but there are also examples in humans. No? Like, for example, the super dominant, if you think about Y chromosome and how it is distributed, look at Genghis Khan and his Y chromosome. His Y chromosome is the most distributed Y chromosome across the i mean the entire globe no because once there was once a time where mongols conquered most of the globe it was the largest empire in the world and that's and you know genghis khan and the mongol culture they have many wives back there then so those things no it can complicate the it can it, that's, that's also the reason that's that's why there are sharper delineation for the case of your Y DNA, since your NRY genes in your Y DNA is distributed by males, and sometimes these males would have sex with multiple wives, it would create a sharper distinction, no? Across different localities. And yes, Genghis Khan was a really prolific breeder. If you go to Mongols, the Persians, the Middle East, in China, you can trace, or most of the time, you will see a, a man 
containing the Y chromosome from Genghis Khan. No? That's how prolific he is. So, if a new population is founded by a small number of males, no? especially for the case of human population as we only have about a thousand members or, or families back then when we move out of sub-Saharan Africa, you can have a, I mean, you would expect a stronger founder effect on the Y chromosomes, no? especially when you have small numbers of male and large number of females. So things like that, you know, scientists consider different things like that in, I mean, estimating how the migration pattern look like. But any of the three, you would suffice, no? Even mitochondrial, even the NRY, YDNA, your gene for skin color, no? so things like that. So aside from those um, genetic markers like your mitochondrial DNA haplogroups and your Y DNA haplogroups, we can also use um, the genetic marker for skin color, no? gene that codes for your melanin productions. And it can also show, as you, have, as you will see in this video, it can also show or trace how the events that took place when we migrated out of Africa. Rainbow of human skin color evolved through natural selection. Now, thanks to advances in anthropology and genetics, exactly how and why it did is no longer a mystery. In humans, different wavelengths of light are reflected or absorbed by a pigment in the top layer of our skin. That pigment's called melanin. It sits inside what look like tiny grains, the melanosomes, that are produced by cells called melanocytes. Our individual genetic inheritance determines the type of melanin inside our melanosomes. The reddish-yellow pheomelanin is more abundant in lightly pigmented people. More darkly pigmented people have more of the brown-black eumelanin. And the more eumelanin, the darker the skin. Melanin also colors human and animal hair and the feathers of many birds. Interestingly, the wavelengths of light that melanin reflects are far less important biologically than the ones it actually absorbs. And of the ones it absorbs, the ones that are the most important are those that we can't even see. Much of the light given off by the sun is invisible to our eyes. Some of that is what's called ultraviolet radiation, which is highly energetic. So much so, it can actually penetrate living cells. When it does, it can wreak havoc within them. It can even cause mutations in skin cell DNA. What stands between us and that threat is the melanin in our skin. Melanin is kind of like the sensor and kind of like a guardian molecule and its main job is protection. For instance, it protects skin cell DNA by forming what are called supranuclear caps and absorbing UV. They're like little parasols around the nucleus and UV cannot penetrate these to go and attack the DNA. How UV exposure varies throughout the world. So this oh, is wow. the Most striking was the clear gradient between the equator and the poles, which was interrupted only in places where altitude increased UV exposure. Oh, look, this is actually in the Tibetan plateau. And persistent cloud cover decreased it. Congo Basin, so it's full of humidity and moisture, which is blocking the UV. George then created a second map using measured skin colors and environmental data. It showed UV intensity does indeed predict skin color. Wherever UV is strong, skin is dark, like it is near the equator or at high altitude. At the poles, the skin of indigenous people is almost always lighter. 
That suggests that variation in human skin melanin production arose as different populations adapted biologically to different solar conditions around the world. As we've noted, our early ancestors probably had full body hair covering pale skin, just like other primates. So when did the darker shades of human skin begin to evolve? DNA sequencing has made it possible to find evidence that can help answer that question. Rick Kittles is a geneticist who's skilled at deciphering such clues. Whenever a species undergoes some form of selection, uh, some form of natural selection, evidence of that selection is found in the genome. And so as geneticists, we get really excited when we explore the genome for these signatures. One way in which that's done is by sampling worldwide populations and looking throughout the genome at variation and comparing across populations. And it's a, it's a very exciting process. I feel like a detective when I, when I go through that, that process. One of the many genes that genetic detectives have linked to human pigmentation is called MC1R. Sampling from around the world indicates there's a fair amount of variation in the DNA sequence of that gene, but not from every corner of the globe. When we look at MC1R within African populations, we don't see a lot of diversity. And the particular allele that they have in those African populations is the one that codes for darker skin. MC1R codes for a protein which is involved in the switch from the production of pheomelanin to eumelanin. The absence of MC1R diversity in African populations indicates that in that part of the world, there is strong negative selection against any alleles that would alter dark skin. And how long has this allele been fixed in African populations? Other genetic studies have calculated that it has been as much as 1.2 million years. Since our species evolved in equatorial Africa, it's reasonable to conclude that by that time, all humans were dark skinned. The fossil record supports what we've gleaned from genetic evidence, but here's where we confront what was for me the heart of the mystery. The evolution of dark skin in humans suggests that under strong UV light, that trait provided a survival advantage. So what exactly was that advantage? It's certainly true UV damage to skin cell DNA can lead to cancer and skin cancer can be fatal. For a long time, that seemed the likeliest explanation. Except, skin cancer generally develops after a person's peak reproductive years. For that reason, though it might cut your life short, it's unlikely to affect your ability to pass on your genes. As I was struggling to conceive of an alternative explanation, I happened to attend a lecture on severe birth defects. That talk was about a research project that had found evidence that certain birth defects are far more common among pregnant women with diets deficient in a B vitamin called folate. Only weeks before, I'd come across a paper that described how strong sunlight breaks down folate circulating in skin blood vessels. Here was a direct link between UV radiation, skin color, and reproductive success. It was a small eureka moment for me. In the years since, we've learned that folate is not only essential for normal embryonic development, it's even needed for healthy sperm production in males. Folate is biological gold. It is an essential nutrient, and it needs to be protected from UV radiation as it circulates in the blood vessels in the skin. That is what melanin does. I felt I was halfway home on my quest to understand human skin color variation. But a big question remained. Why aren't we all dark skinned? It turns out there's another side to our relationship with UV light. UV light is not all bad. 
In fact, the small portion of it known as UVB is critical for the synthesis in our bodies of vitamin D, a process that starts in the skin. Without vitamin D, humans cannot absorb calcium from our diet to build our bones and for a healthy immune system. Back when all our ancestors lived close to the equator, there was no problem getting enough UVB through dark skin to make the vitamin D needed. But then some populations started moving north, where the UV striking Earth's surface is much weaker. In northern latitudes, dark skin makes it hard to produce the vitamin D that human bodies really need. The consequences of vitamin D deficiency include rickets, a bone development disease that can cripple the young. In higher latitudes with less UV, the selective pressure on MC1R that produced dark skin in our ancient ancestors began to abate. When we look at the early movement out of Africa, when that constraint was relaxed, we then see a plethora of variation. In European and Asian populations, Geneticists have discovered greater variation in the MC1R gene, but less variation in several other genes, ones associated with lighter skin types. Different environments led to other genes being selected for and, and being important uh, and for those populations in terms of skin color. Selection for light skin gene variants occurred multiple times in different groups around the world some of it in just the last 10,000 years. Support for the idea that the UV vitamin D connection helped drive the evolution of paler skin comes from the fact that indigenous peoples with diets rich in this essential vitamin have dark pigmentation. All of this talk about evolution, about humans, makes us really ponder on what really matters what does it makes us as humans no? what defines our species and more often than not when people when they hear the concept of evolution and of course this ties with migration of the human species as we encounter different different hominin groups like the Dinosaurians and the neanderthals along the way of our migration more often than not, when people hear the concept of evolution, they have this preconceived notion that we came from monkeys. We're, we're all familiar with this version of human evolution. That a primitive, primitive looking thing give rise to a slightly less primitive thing, giving rise to another and then another, and then finally something like us. No? Something so advanced, a march of progress. Well, that's that's not how evolution works. This gradistic way of looking at evolution is not, but well, it's flawed, no? This evolution is not a graded step ladder where you acquire an ability, become an X Men mutant, and then become more advanced. And don't even get me started with the Pokemons. <laughs> The idea that we're this inevitable walk towards this successful, dominant thing is flawed, no? We are not above the organism, no? We are not greater than these organisms, these animals, these, these, these other organisms here on Earth. I would like you to take a deep look into this. Because guys, we are not the center of the world. Keep your head on the ground. Don't be a narcissist. Not everything is about us. The species around you did not exist for you. The chicken joy that you ate did not exist for you. Well, this is not entirely your fault. The Bible specifically says that we are to govern and rule all of his all of God's creation. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, over every living creature that moves on the ground. Diba? Kung maalala niyo sa Genesis. It's not your fault, no? That's why, well, 
that's the exact same reasoning that led to the colonizer to justify their actions. That's why I'm more akin to our indigenous people's view of the world, no? that we're just a mere member of the land and we are no better than the animals and plants that are in it. We do not own them or rule over them. They are free just as we are free. Because evolution and phylogeny, this lineage thing, isn't a tree that grows up to some march towards some ideal best species. We are slaves through time, no? following the landscape carved out by natural selection. And always at the threat of extinction and at the mercy of currents, at the mercy of nature and space. Being complex and advanced doesn't mean you're successful as a species. No? If the purpose of evolution is for the survival of the species and for the continuity of life, I would say the most successful organism on Earth would be the bacteria. If, say, we go extinct by some catastrophic event, no, God hope, yeah, I hope not, no. I think these organisms, these microorganisms will continue the life for us, no? And start the whole process of evolution again. If the purpose of life is to exist and to continue existing, then all forms of life that we see now, every insect, every plant, every animal, and every microbes, every shape and form, are as successful and as equal in the eyes of evolution and natural selection. Evolution is not a march of progress. Evolution is not like this. Because these forms are still here. They are still surviving, still existing, still fighting the disorder entropy is introducing to them. I'd like to think of life as a continual struggle and protest against the environment against the harsh world, a continual struggle against entropy and death, that, that we are continually being chased down by this heat death. No? We are this struggle, and you should be proud of that. No? When you see death in the face, when you see death face to face, you would say to him, we had a nice run, huh? hadn't we? Then you say, good game, reboot, and start again. <laughs> so the human story of evolution and our migration is really weird. No? We are not, it's not a simple linear march of progress that was popularized by, by the media. It is more complex than that. It is like a braided string. No? I would like to introduce you to the evolutionary concept, the evolutionary model of the braided string. So the braided stream is different from the common misconception, the media popularized march of progress. No? A single lineage of human evolution from stage one to stage three, a less complex to a more complex organism, like a single stepwise gradistic ladder towards success. The braid stream models depicts evolution entirely different. The braided stream model accurately depicts all the processes that could have happened during the future of evolution. It imagine evolution as a braided stream, no, a stream, a delta that flows with many branches and channels. No? At times these branches might diverge from each other or diverge from the main body, but sometimes these channels might also get tangled up within each other or may cease to exist entirely, may join or recombine. So the braided stream model accurately or somehow merged the fact that there are these processes that could have happened. And it distanced us from the idea that humans are this single extant member, the single most important member of the hominin group. It's not like that. We're just lucky that we're the extant species. But evolution is a lot complex. No? It doesn't really say a line of ancestorship. 
evolution is a tangled web of branches of evolutionary biology. Evolution is like a braided string, no? and we are just one end of that string. We are just one branch, no? but we're not the only branch. No? Along the way, we have seen a lot of different hominin groups that have been evolving just like us and have met their end. And perhaps we're the only one that have been extant, that have been surviving a terminal species. No? Others have split off, fade out. Because the idea of a march of progress makes us human, the story of humans, really weird. Yeah? It makes us really strong. It's not the case. No? If you look at the different hominin groups that have existed, we're not the strongest of the bunch. We're not the smartest of the bunch. But, but we could say we're kind of smart. But we're not these, the best, no? the best hominin groups out there. We're just lucky enough that we always live in groups. And living in groups offers protection. And that have made us survive. The braided string model can put things into perspective. It can put things into perspective in the context that we are just as vulnerable as those other hominin groups are. We're not the best cat species. No? We are not the chosen species. We're just lucky enough that we survive. Certain chance events have lined up along our way to have to permit us to be this dominant, the only living member of the taxa. So that's the braided stream model for you. Using the braided stream perspective as an evolutionary model for, as a model for evolution, really can put things into perspective. Often we talk about humans and other animals. We always delineate us no? we, we other ourselves no it's a form of othering we other ourselves as different from these animals but the truth is we are animals just like them no? we think of ourselves as above or beyond but we are just part of the animal kingdom and i think the bread stream model can help us bring ourselves back into the perspective no? that we are just like these organisms are co-inhabitants of this planet but this is not sad no? this is not really a downing to bash the human species there are many myths about creation around the world most agree on one thing no? that humans are special and yes we are no? in a way we need that special story you know, for us to have a sense of the world you know, because we are the center of the world for, in our own way. You know. And we can have that special story in the sense of the evolutionary story. When you look at your own biology, you can tell the story, the special story of evolution. And it's the story. It is a story that we share with every other living thing. So if you think about it, your idea, human bodies, your brain, your everything are part of evolution. It does remove some magic from being a human being, but it doesn't have to be. The grandeur in this view of life is that it is a different kind of magic. Evolution is a totally different kind of magic. That kind that still amazes you, even if you know exactly what's happening.